So did I ever tell you guys the story about how George Barris almost bought my movie Supra? We're well, gonna hear about it right after the break. Confession, I hate cleaning my own cars. That's why I love Adams Polishes. Whatever you want to clean, polish, or shine, Adams has a specific product just for that, even for matte finishes. Since 2000, Adams Polishes has been offering premium car care products dedicated to the enthusiast. Whether you're a professional detailer or a weekend warrior, their innovative and effective products will enable you to achieve amazing results on your prized possession. Adams, made with pride and passion in the USA. One of my earliest childhood memories was the slot car toy set that my dad set up in the basement of our Long Island home in New York. One of the cars from that toy set was the Batmobile from the original TV show of the late 1960s. Now I was pretty much a baby at that particular moment in time, but by 1969 my family had moved to Southern California. And during the 70s, growing up as a latchkey kid in the San Fernando Valley, my after school hours were occupied by homework and reruns of TV shows like Hogan's Heroes, Gomer Pyle U. USMC, Speed Racer cartoons, and Batman, to name a few. And of course, when my parents got home, it was dinner time. But somewhere during this period, I developed a love of cars. No thanks to my dad, because he couldn't care less about cars. Specifically, the cars that I liked were cars with lots of buttons and TV screens on the inside. I blame Tatsuo Yoshida, the creator of the Speed Racer cartoons, and George Barris for building the Batmobile, and these cars inspired me to no end. So you can say I was a car lover from a very, very early age. I even started building models of cars, a hobby that my father didn't really like because he always thought cars were just nothing but appliances, and he couldn't have cared less about cars his entire life. For years, I suspected that I was adopted because my dad bought a Prius. That convinced me that there was no way, no how, no way in hell that that I came from that man's loins. But unfortunately, my 23andMe DNA profile disproved that theory. <laughs> He was my dad. My dad was a Navy veteran, so he'd rather I'd build model ships rather than cars, and I still enjoy building model ships as a hobby today. But my love affair with cars never abated. By the time I was 30, I had already gone through something like 20 cars or so, and I had some great times with many of those cars. My Datsun Zs, my V6 Capri, my 510s, my Firebird, my Chevelle. All of these cars gave me many great memories. Eventually I bought a Supra and you know the rest of that story, but what you don't know is this. When it came time to sell it, I would come to meet one of the men who had a big hand in introducing me to the car hobby, George Barris. It's okay if you don't know who George Barris was, you surely know his work though. Barris had built several cars, many cars in fact, for TV shows like the Munster Coach, remember that thing, that 18 foot long thing? The Dragula, and of course the original Batmobile from the Batman TV show from 1966. This car was actually designed and built by George Barris. Even at a young age, I could tell there was something special about that Batmobile. I didn't know anything about cars, I was probably five years old, six years old, something like that, but I could tell. Many years later, I learned how Barrett pulled it off. He started with a 1955 Lincoln concept car called the Futura, a car that he bought for a dollar in 1966 after being approached by William Dozier to build a car for the new Batman TV series on which he was working. He then turned this concept car into one of the most recognizable cars of my generation and indeed in history. One of those cars actually sold for $4.3 million not long ago. I'd say that's pretty iconic, wouldn't you? If you take a look at the interior of the Futura concept car, it kind of looks pretty similar to the finished Batmobile. Exterior mods were mostly confined to the front bumper and the hood area and some other little styling cues. But basically it was pretty much the same Lincoln Futura from the 1955 concept. Inside the car though, Barris installed a bunch of bat gadgets, that's what they were called. Most of them were props and weren't functional at all, but that's not the point. The point was to make the car fascinating, like science fiction kind of stuff. That technology didn't exist, but the props were in the car, and so the producers faked everything else. That's just the way it was done back then. The point is that years later, I was unknowingly walking along a parallel path insofar as my desire to have lots of gadgets inside my own personal cars. And if you've seen any of my cars, you know there's a lot of junk in there. <laughs> but little did I know that it was only a matter of time before I would meet the man who helped set me on this course. Fast forward to 2001 and I had the privilege of hooking up with Universal to serve the production team on a little car movie that you probably know about. It seems that my humble yellow super had caught the eyes of the producers of the Fast and Furious and when I got the car back from the production I was the proud owner of my very own movie car. A dream I never thought I would ever live. The car came back to me though with movie themed livery and I decided I did not want to be driving around in a boy racer, especially at my age. I was into my 30s by that time. So by late 2001, I was looking for a way out and I decided to sell the car. Back then though, there were no good online options for selling a car beyond eBay. MySpace was still a music platform. 
Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, Twitter, none of those things had been invented by their super villain censor monkey leaders. Gentlemen, I have a plan. The world is mine! The world is mine! So those were not options. So the only other options were print classified ads like DuPont Registry, uh, the Recycler, the Penny Saver, <laughs> and other local regional publications, and that, and that was not going to do it. I wanted to advertise this thing all over the world. I listed the car on eBay, and after seven days, the bidding was up to almost $175,000 or $180,000. But when the bidding closed, I contacted the winning bidder only to find out that this clown didn't have two dimes to rub together. In fact, many of the top bids were just outright fraudulent, and I was going through the, 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 the bids and everything, and I, but after about a day of that, I was so disenfranchised, I just decided to hang on to the car for a while longer. But I was still getting offers on the car privately, and I soon entered in discussions with the foreign buyer. Then one day, I got a call from George Barris, who was interested in buying my car. Wow, that was pretty cool. But his offer was, to put it bluntly, insulting. It was low ball as low ball as low ball. I was like, no, it's not evident. It was also pretty clear from the discussion that George knew next to nothing about Supers and even less about the tuner world, which to me meant that he just wanted the car for a display in his shop. And frankly, I was okay with that. Imagine my car being on display in his shop. But further, a condition of the sale was that I was not to talk about my role in creating the car. That was a giant red flag to me. It indicated to me that he wanted to be the only name attached to that car. And I had heard some rumors, but I didn't believe it until I actually witnessed it. Honestly, that was a rude awakening for me, especially coming from a man who more or less was responsible for my budding interest in cars during my most formative years. Back in the day, I had been by his shop many times. I used to work at a speed shop in the Van Nuys area, and on my lunch breaks, I'd sometimes park by his shop just down the street to see if there was any activity, maybe he was building a cool movie car or a TV car, or maybe even to catch a glimpse of George who I had never met. But that doesn't mean I was gonna accept a low ball offer just because he was famous. If anything, he should be paying full pop for the car because he is famous and he's got the freaking money. I explained to George that I was working out the numbers with the foreign buyer, and if the sale didn't work out, I would get back to him in a few days unless he wanted to sweeten his offer right now or match the offer. When I did get back to him later that week, I told him that I had made a deal with the foreign buyer, and that was the end of the discussion. He then threatened to get an injection to stop the sale of the car, and at that point, the conversation stopped for me. I told him flat out, if he wants to go the attorney route, I have an attorney in the family, and once you say the A word, I'm done talking. I hung up, and that was the end of that. I didn't think about it again until I ran into George again at the SEMA show a couple of years later. He was talking to Barry and McGuire at the time, and I just happened to be standing within earshot. At the time, I was the tuner marketing consultant for McGuire's, and I worked directly under Barry. Barry introduced us, and George immediately changed his happy tune and rudely said something to the effect of, Oh yeah, I remember you. I'll never do business with you again. To which I replied, Great, we finally agree on something. And I simply walked away. To be honest, in retrospect, I was happy that he didn't end up with the car for more reasons than just the sale price. You have to understand the scene at that time. At that point in time, Barris was looking to jump on the Fast and Furious train. He was known for old cars, this was the new world. He actually started a company to start modifying tuner cars and the company was called Faster and More Furious. <laughs> How he didn't get sued for that is beyond my comprehension. But I'll tell you this, it was clear that George's design eye was far better suited for classic cars than it was for tuner cars. I say this because George did get his hands on at least two of the actual Fast and Furious cars. He bought the actual Hero 1 Eclipse from John Lapid. He had it for a while and then he sold it. The Hero 1 Eclipse now sits in the Hollywood Star Cars Museum to this day. At some point, he must have regretted selling it because he somehow got his hands on the stunt number two green eclipse, also screen used car. This car was, how do I describe it, raped. <laughs> oh my God. Frankly, I'm trying to understand the thought process of having a wire loom that went nowhere, a wall light switch plate screwed to the dash with protruding wire caps sticking out of the holes, and no less than eight different non-working gauges on top of the dash, including two or three on the left A-pillar and two or three more on the right A-pillar. What in the name of God was this man thinking? And then some years later, Barris went out and hired Eddie Paul to build replicas of the Green Eclipse and Red RX-7 because he had sold his actual movie cars. What he did to those cars was nothing short of polarizing and controversial. 
In this picture of the RX-7 that he had built to look like a Fast and Furious car, I don't know what was going on here. Why was this thing so high off the ground? It must have been four wheel drive or something. But when he, when he was modifying the interior, it looked like he made another trip down the Pet Boys accessories aisle. It was horrible. No giant exhaust, they had screw on like chrome tips, it was horrible. And the piece de resistance was a ridiculous red slip-on steering wheel cover. Folks, if you put a slip-on cover on your steering wheel, please pick another hobby. You are doing it all wrong and you don't know what the hell you're doing. Then of course, in the bear style, he added his own logos all over the car. For good measure, he sprinkled in some fake Sneaky Pete nitrous bottles <laughs> and what looks to be extra bits from a Back to the Future DeLorean prop car. And then just today, I learned that the Mecham auction that's coming up in Florida in January in 2022 will be auctioning off two quote unquote fast and furious cars. But you better read the fine print. The first listings I saw of this car uh, were this weekend and they were pretty vague. Frankly, they implied that these were actual screen used cars. Turns out these are the cars that Barris had Eddie Paul build so that Barris could go display these cars at Autorama shows all over the country that were going on back then. And he was getting paid appearance fees to have those cars out as Fast and Furious cars, although they were never actually in Fast and Furious movies at all. I have no problem with this. You know, it's his money, it's his taste in mods, fine, whatever. But this is what pisses me off. Look at the second bullet point. Vin Diesel never set foot in this car. He had nothing to do with it, had nothing to do with Universal. Oh, you see this guy? See this guy? Number one bullshit guy. These cars were never in the movie. So are they Fast and Furious cars? They're not even good enough to be called replicas. Frankly, this document is misleading and I believe it was purposely misleading. He wants to create the air that those cars were actually a part of the movie. So if you're thinking on bidding on either of these two cars, you'd be buying these because you're a fan of George Barris, not because these cars had any affiliation with the actual movie, because they didn't. I wanna make that perfectly clear. And of course, none of this should take away from Barris's contributions to the auto customizing hobby. I'm not trying to take anything away from the guy. He earned his respect. And for those of you who don't know, Barris's history actually goes back to the early 1950s. He's built dozens of TV show cars, movie cars, and custom cars for big name celebrities, and nothing can take that away from him. You can say he did things his own way, taking styling and design cues from the heyday era in which he cut his teeth building cars for the big screen productions and the big celebrities of that time. Now some say his classic design methodology didn't really fit the tuner car market, but you can't fault a guy for trying to reinvent himself. But in a world that is today moving so rapidly, perhaps time had just passed him by. And on November 5th, 2015, George Paris, the California King of Customs, passed away in Los Angeles, California. I'm honored that he selected one of my creations to be among the many amazing cars in his shop. And so while my one business dealing with him didn't really work out the way I would have liked it to, I will always remember him as one of the pivotal people in my life. His passion for all things automotive definitely contributed to me having my passion. And so George, thanks for the memories and your contributions to the TV and motion picture movie car industry. That's gonna be it for this episode, everybody. Thanks so much for watching, and please don't forget to subscribe so you can get notifications when new episodes drop. We'll see you next time.